At the height of the space race, the United States and the Soviet Union bitterly tried to outdo one another, each attempting to be the first to succeed in a number of scientific and exploratory challenges. In the beginning, the Soviets won many of the firsts, such as launching the first craft to enter Earth's orbit, Sputnik 1, in October 1957, sending to space the first living animal, Laika, on Sputnik 2 in November 1957, and putting the first man in orbit with Yuri Gagarin's mission in April 1961. In fact, by most accounts, the USSR was even ahead of the United States in sending the first man to the moon by the time U.S. President John F. Kennedy's famous We Choose to Go speech in 1962. To go to the, moon in this decade and do the other thing. The Soviets had already landed the Luna 2 probe on the moon's surface in 1959, and they were in the middle of developing a manned mission that was strikingly similar to the U.S. effort. Yet that early success would eventually be forgotten as the Soviet Union buried their final moon missions in secrecy. Because just as Neil Armstrong was setting foot on the lunar surface on July 20th, 1969, the Luna 15 lander was crashing under the other side of the moon. It's a story the Soviets did not want the world to know. The USSR's Luna space program first appeared in 1958, three years earlier than NASA's Apollo program. The Soviets successfully launched the Luna 1 station, the first spacecraft to go beyond Earth's orbit, after three failed attempts. Accidentally, it overshot past the moon. The Luna 2 mission brought the next successful touchdown for the Soviets in 1959. The spacecraft was the first human-made object to reach the moon as well as the first human-made object to ever make contact with another celestial body. Also in 1959, Luna 3 took the first photos of the dark side of the lunar surface. The photos, though low quality, shook the world. They revealed a landscape unlike that of the near side of the moon. The mountainous terrain of two dark, low-lying regions, Mare Moscoviense, Sea of Moscow, and Mare Desideri, Sea of Desire, captivated the public. In February 1966, the 219-pound Luna 9 became the first spacecraft to achieve a soft landing on the surface of the moon. As the 1960s drew to an end, what would become arguably the grand prize of the space race remained up for grabs, sending the first person to set foot on the moon. The United States wanted that prize. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy pledged that Americans would fly to the moon by the end of the decade. Not surprisingly, the Soviets were determined to get there first. It was 1967, and the space race to the moon was neck and neck between the two superpowers. The Soviet moon landing project, Luna 15, was plagued by issues. The proposed plan was too complicated. The cosmonaut would have to physically get out of the orbiting craft and complete a spacewalk just to get onto the moon landing craft. How exactly this exit and spacewalk between the two crafts could be executed safely was proving a diabolical conundrum for the Soviets. The logistical headaches for the Soviet space agency only began there. On the way back from the hypothetical moonwalk, the cosmonaut would have to carry a huge specimen bag of moon samples through the gravity-free vacuum. More so, the Soviets were stumped on how to rendezvous in orbit not to mention how to actually land on the moon. Perhaps most worryingly, their rocket simply didn't have the sheer thrust required. Getting to the moon requires launching a command module and a lander. Both are heavy objects and require massive amounts of thrust to simply get into orbit. Regardless, the ruling Soviet Politburo had given its space agency no more than 18 months to get a man on the moon. They wanted the lunar landing to take place in time for the 50th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, in October of 1967. The Soviet space agency was aghast. It knew the task was near impossible. Luna 15 couldn't fulfill the leadership's expectations. Despite this knowledge, the mission was forced to proceed. In 1967, the much louder and respected cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin inspected Soyuz 1, the module that was supposed to get a Soviet crew to the moon. 
Gagarin found no less than 203 structural problems with the module. He recommended a postponement of the practice launch on Soyuz 1. With their hands tied by orders from the Kremlin, the officials replied that any such delay would be impossible. Gagarin was reportedly furious, claiming it would be a suicide mission for any cosmonaut on board. Gagarin was also swayed by the fact that his best friend, Vladimir Komarov, was scheduled for the test flight on the capsule. Gagarin, who was the backup pilot, was so invested in keeping his friend alive that he showed up on launch day, April 24th, 1967, demanding to go in Vladimir's place. Ignoring Gagarin's protest, Vladimir Komarov was sent into orbit that day on Soyuz 7K OK, the first manned flight of the first generation of Soyuz spacecraft. It all went spectacularly wrong from the moment he was in orbit. The solar panel didn't work, so the power in the capsule systems failed. His orientation detectors froze, so he couldn't maneuver the craft. The problem snowballed. Komarov's automatic stabilization system died, and his manual stabilization system was only partially functional. Only the Earth's gravity kept the module in orbit, avoiding a freefall into space. The craft managed 13 orbits around planet Earth, after which the entire mission was cut short. The range of issues with the craft made it an inevitable decision. The second Soyuz module, from which cosmonauts were to perform an extravehicular activity, or EVA, to the Soyuz 1, was never launched. Instead, Komarov was summoned back to Earth. Unfortunately, the main braking parachute got tangled on re-entry, which meant the Soyuz couldn't slow its speed. The re-entry itself into the Earth's atmosphere was successful, but the lack of a parachute meant the module crashed into the ground. Komarov perished in the collision. During this time, use of radio for contact between the craft and Soviet control meant that U.S. scientists at NASA could, and did, listen in on the entire debacle. The cosmonaut could allegedly be heard crying and cursing. Even Komarov's wife was patched in, begging him to tell her what she should say to their children. Three months after three crew members of Apollo 1 lost their lives in the launch pad to a fire during a test at Cape Kennedy, Vladimir Komarov became the first fatality of a spaceflight. Depressingly, it was well known that Komarov felt the impending doom of the mission. However, patriotic duty came before anything else for the cosmonaut. So much so, he was adamant about not letting his backup and best friend, Yuri Gagarin, take his place. There were additional setbacks for the Soviet lunar program, even before Soyuz 1 had taken off. The previous unmanned test of the 7K OK Cosmos-133 and Cosmos-140 rockets had been failures. Subsequent to the Soyuz-1 failure to reach lunar orbit, disaster reigned. Soyuz-5's landing was so hard that it broke the pilot's teeth, and he was so off course that he had to find shelter at a peasant's house before he was rescued. Soyuz-6, 7, and 8 all failed to dock properly. By the start of July 1969, the Soviets knew America would beat them at sending men to the moon first. And so the USSR intended to compete by launching the highly classified Luna 15 to be the first vehicle to collect lunar soil and bring it back to Earth. Its launch was deliberately slated for three days before the US mission to the moon. For the Soviets, it was a case of now or never. Nothing was publicly known about the Luna 15 flight plan so NASA was very concerned about possible interference with its Apollo 11 mission. The Soviets would eventually reassure them that there was nothing to worry about. The five-ton Soviet station approached the moon on July 17th and went into near-lunar orbit. That was three days before the now-launched Apollo 11 mission would arrive. Due to miscalculations and mistakes, the unmanned Soviet spacecraft got stuck in lunar orbit. Even after America's Apollo 11 had landed on July 20th, the Soviet controllers were still wrestling with calculations for their craft. By the time Armstrong and Aldrin were personally collecting lunar soil, Lunar 15 had orbited overhead no fewer than 52 times. 
The Soviet leadership demanded that the craft land. Four minutes later, Luna 15 landed and crashed into a lunar mountainside. The apparatus presumably lies there to this day. The only lunar first that the Soviets achieved after July 1969 was with Luna 16. The first craft to successfully extract a sample of lunar soil and return it to Earth in September of 1970, achieving what Luna 15 had failed to do. That was 14 months after Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. The Soviet space agency had to turn its attention elsewhere. As a new aim, they sought to get cosmonauts on Venus and Mars. Some of their plans were fantastically ambitious. One of the more outrageous proposals was a plan to get a six-man team to land on Mars and live there for a year. Those cosmonauts would then assemble a nuclear-powered train with which to traverse and explore the Red Planet. Eleven men and fourteen dogs died in Russian tests that tried to emulate the train meant for Mars. None of these manned projects from Mars or Venus came to fruition. Finally, the Soviets directed their energy towards their space station. At least that project was, and still is, a success. The International Space Station has survived well after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It is the single longest running space program to date. It was only in 1989 that the Soviets finally admitted the truth about their failed lunar program even though other world powers had long been aware of their attempt. In fact, Britain's Lovell telescope had been tracking and recording the Luna 15 mission as it orbited the moon for three days before it began its descent. Perhaps nothing would signify the Soviet failure more than the voices of the Apollo 11 astronauts that were inadvertently caught in the background. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind.